Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for another very special edition of Wowza Live with our host, Ned Dennison. Ned? Hello, everyone. I'm the chairperson of the International Marathon Swimming Hall of Fame. We have two of our honorees with us today, Roger and Val Parsons. They're currently uh, sitting in Spain, but they've got some uh, strong roots in England and a bit of time in Canada. We'll get to that in time. Uh, they're both honorees of the International Marathon Swimming Hall of Fame, and they, uh, they jointly received the David's Wheeler um, award from the International Swimming Hall of Fame in 2004 for just an incredible contribution to the administration of the sport. Folks, say hello. Hello, everybody. Hi. Um, tell us about your very early involvement in the British Long Distance Swimming Association. For the viewers who don't know about this, um, the BLDSA is an honor organization and, and literally was one of the original you know, uh, volunteer, but professionally run associations in the world that did tremendous things for the sport. And, and you two were in there uh, after the founding, but uh, with a huge contribution. Okay. Well, for me, uh, it all began in 1970 after completing a six miles uh, sponsored swim. Um, uh, it was a charity and when I was told at the time that I'd taken was faster than the current ladies British record holder in Lake Bala in Wales that sort of set a chord and uh, looked into long distance swimming that was going on in England and I joined the BLDSA in 1971. Uh, my first three major competitive years uh, I swam in uh, some 30 40 events uh, I won 38 uh, and also finished ahead of all the men in 17 of those races so I did set a little bit of a precedent to begin with but following that um, I was elected to the National Executive Committee of the BLDSA and uh, a newly formed post of International Secretary was made um, to which I was elected and I held that position for 15 years from 1973 until 88 when we emigrated out to Spain during this time, um, I first, my first um, thing was to try and uh, compile as comprehensive a list as possible of all the open water swimming events around the world because our uh, list at that time was nothing virtually. Um, to this end, I took the FINA handbook and wrote to all the member federations um, asking if uh, they were running events, would they send information and if um, they would like to, if something could be organised um, uh, have a uh, come to a symposium or meeting to discuss uh, worldwide contributions. Uh, unfortunately, um, this didn't uh, come to anything because the uh, lack of finance or support from ASA and BLDSA, um, there was nothing available to put up any sort of a meeting. So sadly, it just uh, became um, a list of events that I managed to put extras to what we had. I kept in touch with everybody um, and basically it didn't go any further. But the best thing to come out of that exercise was our first contact with the Imshoff honorary Dale Petranich uh, in America, who was a kindred spirit. He had the same enthusiasm and dedication as we did. Um, and uh, myself, Dale and Roger worked to try and get Fina interested in looking at open water swimming. Um, due to my personal commitments, I was unable to continue uh, training for marathon events after that, but went into the administration side in more uh, detail. Uh, in 1976, I inaugurated and ran a BLDSA International Trials for GB Team Swimming Section. Um, and alongside Roger, we'd done quite a lot of work together then. Uh, and in 1976, uh, we completed the partnership and got married. Um, so now we were sort of officially team Parsons, if you like. Uh, from 1977 until 83, I was British team manager and organised the administration of all the swimmer entries to overseas events. And I returned to the position of team manager for the 86 British team competing in the FINA World Cup in Egypt. Um, I was presented in 1979 the highest award of the BLDSA, um, the James Brennan Award for um, outstanding services to the sport at that point. Um, we, uh, we then had the Silver Ju Jubilee uh, year between 91 and 82. Um, myself um, were in, involved in uh, working on 
1982, Roger masterminded the idea of a new event, Champion of Champions. And this idea was to solve the argument of who was better, the fastest swimmers or the ones with the best endurance. Um, it was made up of a series of three races on the same day uh, with short gaps between each one, five miles, three miles and one mile. I became the organising secretary and of course working in partnership with Roger it became a very successful event and uh, 35 years on it's still one of the BLDSA premier events each season. Um, we um, were jointly presented in 82 with again the James Brennan award from the BLDSA and that's the first time in the history of BLDSA that the award's gone twice to one person. But, um, basically, uh, from then on, uh, we were involved with um, FINA IMSA. Roger, your involvement. Yeah, pretty much. Um, I, at the time, was serving in the Royal Navy in the submarine service uh, and was seconded from that into the, uh, the Department of Sports and Recreation uh, to become the Navy swimming coach responsible for the entire uh, aquatics programs of the Royal Navy. Uh, throughout Great Britain and for that matter around the world. Um, I first swam in open water swimming in 71 which was a very short little dinky one from one just over one mile from uh, Portsmouth to South Sea Piers. Enjoyed it so much that I managed to get a group of swimmers together who were also interested that would swim that race with me uh, and we went joined the BLDSA and entered into to their events um, from there met Valerie and uh, got more and more involved. Uh, during that time, um, I was part of, I was still swimming at that time and still playing water polo. Um, and uh, in the open water, I represented GB in the Hapoel Games in Israel, again with Valerie as part of that team. And I was also the coach for the British team, which was the first time, I think that, that, that one, it was the first time that uh, swimming GB recognized an open water swimming team uh, in that capacity. Uh, the other things I seem to get all the oddball events thrown at me from by the BLDSA. Um, the biggest one of all was um, being asked to do a, a centennial celebration swim for the Captain Webb in uh, 1975. And as you can imagine, the undertaking for that was unbelievably complex because the French authorities had banned uh, mass starts from French waters. Uh, Britain frowned on it but couldn't legally do anything about it. So there was a tremendous amount of uh, political work, which I hate at the best of times, going on. But the thing was a great success. We had 12 teams from around the world uh, and it went very well. And I became somewhat of a celebrity within the Navy as at that time the president of the Royal Navy Swimming Association was an admiral and he just happened to be the admiral of the reserve fleets. And when we were doing the briefing meeting, I had Jerry Fosberg as my safety officer. And uh, at the briefing meeting, a Royal Navy Lieutenant Commander approached and uh, asked if they could speak to Mr. Parsons. And I was introduced to them and they said, oh, the Admiral's regards and you have us for three days. And there were three minesweepers. <laughs> <laughs> so the swim had the safety of three minesweepers, one in the front, one each side, telling everybody to get out of the way of the swimmers. <laughs> so it was quite an event, I can assure you. And, and clearing um, the way of any mines. <laughs> yeah. Um, at the same time, because uh, contacts I'd got um, through the, the Navy Sports Department, um, triathlon at that time was, was, was taking off. And of course, they were involved in open water swimming. And um, I was sucked into that as well in helping um, to, to put together the, the British safety regulations for the open water in, in triathlon. And uh, also uh, was a delegate from the British Triathlon Union to the first ever uh, formation of the European Triathlon Union. Um, the other big thing that we got involved with was the London to Paris Triathlon and again, uh, we ran it for two years and so that's twice again I organized relay teams going across uh, the English Channel this time from England to uh, to France. Uh, other than that I just hang more or less hung on to uh, Val's coat tails and picked up the pieces <laughs> and always provided with a, a dry towel whenever I could. 
and and dropped to your knee at one point and and gave her a wedding ring at, following after that Some, somewhere along the line um one of the things that um, won't be apparent to the viewers because we spent a lot of time talking to professional marathon swimmers in the last couple of months is the bldsa and the amateur swimming association in england we're, we're probably one of the staunchest supporters of the whole amateur status in the world. So d describe to us um, these GB teams that you, you formed. They were amateur. Yes, that's correct. And the, the Windermere Championships, the international, they again were amateur. Absolutely, yes. Not and, a professional insight. <laughs> and, and we have um, a, a kind of a dearth of... English professional swimmers in that period compared to Argentinian or Canadian or Dutch uh, who, who seemed to come out into the pro leagues quite, quite quickly. Um, I, for me, it looks like the BLDSA had created an incredible community, laid on an incredible competitive competition scene in the, in the summery months. And, and the, the, the loss of amateur status would almost be like dropping out of a family. Is that a fair statement? Very much so. Um, the control that the Amateur Swimming Association held over everybody was absolute. If you took place in a race that a professional was in, you would be banned from swimming for life in Great Britain. It was as strict as that. Uh, there were British swimmers popping around the country, but you won't find them under their own names. Uh, it, one of the things that barriers that we were desperate to break down was this barrier between amateur and professional. Because how can you say that someone is a world champion when only a certain number of people can compete? If, if a person's a world champion, they're competing against all the rest, the best in the world, amateur and professional. And to be honest, apart from the big, big prize money races, the, the Daily, Mail, Daily Mail races, and the Wrigley's events, people were receiving peanuts. You know, they, they weren't receiving a mass money. They just about covered the, the cost of accommodation and flights for them and the trainers. So it was crazy that there was this divide between the two parts of the swims. Well, there were, there were a few professional swimmers who were, who were making a lot of money. Um, some of those early uh, Canadian national exhibitions, some of the Lake St. Jean's, it was um, it was money. Uh, Her Herman Vilmsy was on a couple of days ago, and we asked him a question about that, and he said one of his winnings from Lake Saint Jean was equivalent to seven years' pay as a teacher. Mm. Yeah, uh, and uh, you know, I don't know the relative amounts, but he he did the calculation for us. Roger, uh, take that thought and and move into your early involvement with FINA, and and for for the viewers who who might not understand the history. Um, FINA is now the organization that is putting on world championships, they're putting on uh, FINA Ultra Marathon Cups, they're ultimately part of the package that's got us in the Olympics. But before FINA, it was uh, several different associations, it was um, some amateur events, um, there were races around the world, and it was really quite a confusing scene. So take us from from that and give us a bridge into the into the FINA world? Uh, yeah, it, the swims were there, but no one knew they were there. Uh, Val had done all that preparatory work in, in trying to get everybody, all the information from everybody that we knew uh, and all the, the national governing bodies. But whatever happened for us to get open water swimming into the Olympic Games, it was a, the only route that we could see available at that time was through the FINA itself uh, because all they had to do was add it as an event. It wasn't a new sport, it would just be an event within the FINA program. Um, so try first, the first barrier that had to be broken down was the professional amateur thing and that was already underway. Um, American swimmers uh, were known to be receiving money uh, going Olympic swimmers. Um, people were receiving all sorts of uh, assistance, shall we say, with their coaching programs and companies were sponsoring people. So it, the barriers at that time were already starting to break down, uh, but it wasn't as, uh, as cut and dried as we had with 
swimmers literally swimming a race and being handed an envelope with a, a pile of prize money in it. And part of the work that we wanted to do was to, to try and get that sorted out and, and give everybody an open field to play on. Uh, and that was what we worked towards. The, the, the work that uh, Dale and Val and I did uh, was, shall we say, a lot of it was knocking on the door of FEMA. And we kept knocking and kept knocking and kept knocking until eventually somebody opened the door. And eventually uh, people like Gunnar Werner got involved, who was the vice president and uh, became a very good friend of uh, open water swimming. <clears throat> uh, but again, he, he was a FINA man, a FINA vice president. Um, there was very little support within the Bureau of the FINA for open water swimming. They saw it as a threat. There was a wonderful occasion in Australia where Lafui, the president of the, of the FINA, sat down at a table that I was already sat on with Mark Alescu, his, his, his gopher guy, and he didn't know who the hell I was, but he turned around to my ask Alescu and said, these are open water swimmers. Do we want anything to do with them whatsoever? <laughs> then, he asked, was, then he asked you to pass the bread. <laughs> oh, no, he, he got up and moved. <laughs> so, you know, it, it was this, this tainting of people because they were involved in open water swimming. And the fact that a lot of, um, in the national groupings, a lot of the swims weren't, in any way connected to their national governing bodies who were members of FINA for the obvious reasons that they were doing nothing about it themselves. So that, that was where we came from to, to try and do it. And after the uh, Long Distance Swimming Commission was formed, uh, people started to sit up and, and take notice. Um, again, there was still the opposition within the FINA Bureau, uh, which, which went on. For, in fact, as we're seeing at the moment, it's probably still going on uh, to open water swimming. Well, this um, this process of getting uh, open water swimming into the Olympics, um, the, the shortest period that anybody will say is, is a little more than 20 years, but you go back far enough and people will say they've been working on it for 30 years. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, you, we won the first. You, you, you then did a, a quite a, um, a difficult political move. You've got two major swimming associations um, to kind of come together into a new association, the IMSA. T tell us first of all about what it looked like before that happened. And then, you know, who were the, who were the big egos that had the biggest trouble, you know, dropping their own flag and picking up a new one? The, the two main bodies that were around at the time was the, the, the one that represented the swimmers, which was the World Professional Marathon Swimming Federation. And the other one was a group, which was basically, it was the Egyptians and the Italians who had the International Long Distance Sw uh, Swimming Federation. Uh, both of them nominated events to be their, their own world championships. Um, and they were pretty much at each other's throats. The swimmers wanted more money. The promoters wanted to give them less. That was, that was the meat and potatoes of the long-standing argument. Uh, the swimmers wanted more protection and everything else. And the, the promoters wanted to keep their costs down. I was amazed uh, when meeting the people at the Capri Napoli for the first time, when we'd been invited over there, um, we got the invite and uh, I think we've got about a week's notice before the, the swim. Yeah. So we've had to rush around and get some air tickets organized. And they said, when you arrive, you'll be okay. We'll see, see you some accommodation. Uh, and we got out there. And the amazing thing was immediately, with the promoters particularly, um, they wanted to know, um, how FINA could be involved, uh, how, you know, how could uh, everything be, be jacked up to a new level. Uh, with the swimmers, uh, there was a bit more reserve with the top swimmers that we got to speak to. In, they were all a little worried that coming anywhere near FINA would mean the end of their swimming careers because they defied their organizations by taking part in professional swims, um, completely separate from the governing bodies. 
So with those things in mind, I was able to sit down with the, 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 the two groups and uh, give them any assurance that if we went ahead, the one thing that we, Fran and I would always try and, try and do is to protect their rights, the rights of the promoters who are already promoting uh, swims and the right of the swimmers, regardless of their past or whatever, that they should have the right to, to compete in any future events that, that came under a, uh, the international FINA banner. Um, from that meeting in Capri, we were of course, the uh, next thing is, well, well, you've come to Capri, now you've got to come to Canada. You can't just go to Capri and not come to Canada. Um, and we ended up on this wild goose chase, well, goose chase, <laughs> this wild chase, shall we say, around the world, in all one after the other. We got to um, the Magog uh, swim and were stunned by what they were doing. I mean, if, you know, if one's never been to the, May, uh, the men from Magog swim, they put a week's massive fiesta around the swim, including big rock concerts, uh, art exhibitions, art competition. It's a whole community thing that a lot of Quebec is involved in. Uh, and the same with Roberval. <clears throat> Although Roberval is quite a small town, uh, the reaction up there is, is unbelievable. Uh, they have these big concerts the night before the swim um, and so on. So we were getting, it was a new world for us. You know, we were seeing not people paying out of their own pockets to do things and uh, can I borrow your little rowing boat because I'm taking this sort of 10 miles up there. <laughs> we, we suddenly saw this vast organization <clears throat> and it became instantly apparent that if FINA could harness this existing uh, spirit and organizational expertise, putting together a World Series would be the easiest thing in the world. So that's, that's how it launched, shall we say. So this, uh, this World Series was, was in the history of our sport, was, was literally the first time that there was one governing organization doing a, a, a kind of a world championship. Before that, you had events doing it. You had uh, Capri Naples as part of the international. You had uh, the World Professional Swimmers Organization had a point series. So you pulled together a point series. You were bringing FINA along with you. Um, in year one, it was IMSA. And in year two, FINA stepped up to the plate and said, okay, guys, we're, we're in. To tell us about how that happened and then how it kind of went not so well, well, well the, after that. The, the people in FINA Bureau who, who, I wouldn't say sympathetic, but recognized uh, what we were doing and the potential of it, managed to give us a little bit of a protection, shall we say, into what we were doing. To the extent that they were quite the Bureau became, it became quite content for me to continue with trying to put this together um, and didn't interfere or block that, that, that thing. They could see the potential if it would work. And it was just a great shame that um, just prior, we'd already um, put together the, the framework, the nuts and bolts of, of um, the, the first World Series. Uh, to run in 92 and it was only when we were given the after or, or going back uh, to the FINA Congress uh, in Perth at the World Championships we were told that open water swimming uh, would be looked at by the FINA as an event in the Olympic Games but after the inclusion of I think it was duos was it in Synchro, synchro swimming. duo swimming synchro was the next event they were pushing forward and the next one uh, after that was going to be synchronized diving so we would be then considered to be the next event that they would put forward for as part of their program so i mean that meant a 12-year wait to get into the olympics um i'm not a very patient person <laughs> and it became apparent that uh, if you know, in our lifetime, we were going to get it done. Um, we needed some way to, to put pressure on. And uh, because of what had happened there, uh, with, with that reveal, uh, that there were going to be long delays. 
uh, the promoters themselves um, were a little upset because they got the same objectives we had. They wanted to see their sport in, in the Olympic Games. They weren't just businessmen. They were enthusiasts that were putting on these events. Um, and so when we couldn't get the, the assurances we wanted from FINA, um, we had a, a special meeting at Robberval and uh, the IMSA was, or the IMSF as it was called at that time, uh, was formed literally to run a World Series. Uh, the, the, the IMSF, IMSA thing came about because uh, actually FINA asked that we didn't use the word federation and to say on good terms, the IMSF said, not a problem. We're now the International Marathon Swimming Association, which was a better suited to what, what was going on. Um, so that, that was virtually, our, our, our IMSA was formed. And why this, it wasn't a break with FINA. Let's just say that FINA were gently pushed aside. <laughs> For a tiny little organization like IMSA against the might of FINA was probably a little bit hard to understand, but that's literally what happened. Uh, and the IMSA, uh, or IMSF as it still was, uh, from there, put on the, the first World Series for Marathon Swimming in running from January 1992. There's a lot of confusion over the, the numbering, shall we say, of the World Series. But it, there's no confusion whatsoever for the number of events, that, the number of times that there was a World Series. The only confusion is by the fact that FINA, when it took over the World Series on their own bequest, suddenly decided that nothing had happened before. <laughs> so this is why you've got two first and two second World Series and so on. But chronologically, they ran from 1992 onwards. So by, by the end of 1997, early 1998, FINA had literally at this point adopted, adopted the sport. There was a, a FINA World Championship. There were um, at least two series cups, uh, one for the 10 kilometer distance and one for a longer distance. And by 2008, uh, the promised land, we're in the Olympics. Uh, give us, um, for, from your perspective, because there's there's probably, you know, fewer than 10 people in the world who had a big, big role in this. So first of all, thank you. Um, give us the best things about FINA being involved and then give us the, one or two concerns you might have of, 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 of FINA and the future for the sport. You want to say? Oh, if you're, <laughs> you're the general secretary. <laughs> The obvious uh, big advantage uh, of the FINA support was the global um, media attention that they could command. At that time, they were already talking about setting up their own television production companies to cover their own events. Uh, they got this enormous budget that they could throw at anything that they wanted. Uh, so it, it made sense that if we're, we're going to have a World Series, then we didn't need to have fragmentation we needed everyone to, everybody to be under the same umbrella and all competing equally and uh, fairly against each other. The big breakthrough was when the IMSA stepped back and that happened immediately after the FINA gave assurances that every swimmer and every promoter that had taken part in previous IMSA or other events organized prior to this, you know, that day, would have the right to enter the World Series of the FINA. And th that was the, the, the line that, that they eventually agreed to, which we'd asked for in 1991. This was the, um, if for, for the Americans, this was the Jim Thorpe story. He went to Stockholm in whatever, 19, 1908 or whatever the year was, won the decathlon, won the pentathlon, declared the best athlete in the world. And a couple of years later, somebody said, oh, by the way, 10 years ago, you played baseball and somebody gave you 50 bucks. You were, you were a pro, we're taking it all away from you. So this was the protection the swimmers had. It said there was no bad professional past that was going to come and penalize them. Yeah. Mm. 
And your concerns uh, for the involvement in FEMA for the future, what, what magic have we lost or what potential is, is reduced? For me, the, um, first of all, the magic. When we used to tell people way back in, in, the, in the 70s what we were trying to do and, um, and why we were trying to do it, there was just disbelief. We're talking about people who spent all their lives in swimming. But it was just disbelief. Why would anyone get into an ice cold lake and swim 26 miles or do this or, or, or do that? There was a mystery and a mystique to a person saying, I'm a long distance swimmer. And what worries me more than anything at the moment is that mystique has been completely eroded. It's been eroded mostly by the corruption of the word marathon. You have two definitions of marathon. You've actually got the distance from marathon to, to, to Athens, which is the correct distance of a marathon within the swimming taking in the hardships of the swim experts that we contacted and i talked about some of the world leaders in hypothermia and, and uh, in sports uh, medicine agreed that the shortest distance that should be called a marathon is 25 kilometers and the reason for that is no one or very very rarely would a person be able to get out of a 1500 meter pool swim and swim in a 25 or longer um, open water swim. Very, very well. So that was the good criteria. And I feel that we now get events of 10 kilometers and five kilometers being called marathons. You know, we'll swim across the pool and call it a marathon because we'll get more sponsorship that way. You know, it, it, to me, it's eroded the, the beauty of the sport. It really has. And the other thing I think that's uh, a problem is that swimmers do not have individual escorts. Uh, in all open water swims, swimmers must be protected. It's the first rule the BLBC ever had, and it's the one thing that we stamped on everything that we uh, prepared as the Long Distance Commission of the FINA, that the safety was the first paramount importance of the swimmers. And now you've got these mass starts, you've got people all going to a turn void without any chance of separation. Uh, you've got people banging into each other, you've got goggles coming up. It, it, it's not a beautiful sport. It's, it's, it's like startled goldfish banging into the walls of a goldfish. Bowl. And I think that we need in the future to make a separation that marathon swimming should be outside the feasibility of most people's imagination to participate in. It should be something special. And the other thing is that every swimmer should have an escort boat and a safety person in that boat. Uh, and you know, the, I've seen some sites uh, at the swim that are stunning. <laughs> the, the start of the Captain Webb uh, relay, we were sat off Cape Brunei. Um, I was in uh, one of the escort boats because I was also swimming as well as organizing it. And when the dawn came up and the rocket went off to start the swim, you got the mist, you got this beautiful, beautiful flat can't see, and you got the swimmers then coming off, off the shore. And it was, it was magical. So I think we need to get back to that. And I, as an Olympic sport, what the hell? Let's have the full marathon distance. Let's go from marathon to Athens in a race, to and from, or one circuit, but no more. Yeah, completely agree. Was I getting agitated then? <laughs> well, I, I, think, I think it is, it is worth mentioning that you're, you're not the only one that has the, has the view that uh, 10K is, is not worthy of the, of the term marathon. Um, you're not the only one that that says, look, you know, when you when you look out at the at the race and and you see boat with somebody's name on the side of it, you, you know who that is in the water. But when you're in the stands and you're looking at people competing in a in a rectangular course in a in a uh, rowing basin, and there's five people in the leading pack, it's kind of more like the Tour de France than it is uh, an epic marathon swim. So you're not the only ones with that concern. It it uh, 
and I'm sure it'll, it'll continue to be a topic of conversation in the sport. Um, Roger and Val, again, I want to thank you. Um, our sport um, has never been the same now that it's in the Olympics, the amount of tension, uh, the, the, the path for swimmers is, is incredibly different. And there's very few people that we can look to and we can say, the, these couple of people here had a huge, huge role in making that happen. So again, thank you very much for all of your contributions. Thank you. Thank you. We'd just like to say that uh, throughout all of our involvement with open water and marathon swimming, it's always been our objective to see it accepted as an Olympic sport uh, with amateurs and professionals competing together uh, in open competition as equals. And we've now actually seen that dream come true, which is, uh, you know, it puts the icing on the cake from that point of uh, view. And uh, we've always volunteered and worked with trying not to have any political or personal agenda uh, for the future benefit of the sport, the swimmers and uh, the promoters and governing bodies. And just to say that it's been an honour and a privilege to have been involved in the evolution and development uh, of the sport that we love during all these years. And we hope that our efforts have gone some way to achieving what we've been trying to do. Thank you.